going on everybody? Today we're going to be talking about gunfighters in the American West. Which you can use to create a historically accurate gunfighter character in Red Dead Online. Now in this series we've covered mountain men, cowboys, natives, lawmen, and outlaws. And while many of these men carried guns, very few were actual gunfighters. A gunfighter is a killer. A man who, through previous confrontations, cultivated the skills, nerve, and capacity to empty his bullets into other men, often under duress. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we need to take a step back and talk about the factors that led to the gunfighting era. Let's get started. According to Jeremy Agnews, the Old West in fact in film, History vs. Hollywood, quote, gunfights were rare in the 1850s because the rapid fire killing technologies of reliable revolvers was not widely available. Western gun violence was also low during the early 1860s because most young men were all fighting in the Civil War. As such, it wasn't until factors aligned, that is, the common availability of reliable revolvers and post-war migration of violent young men west, that the gunfighting era of the Wild West came to be. Statistically, the number of shootouts in the West increased until they peaked in 1878, whereupon they leveled off and declined in the 1890s, as the western frontier was brought under law and order. As such, the prime years of being an American gunfighter were in the 1870s and 1880s. It should come as no surprise then that the most famous gunfighters of the Wild West, Hardin, Earp, Hickok, Reeves, Billy the Kid, and others, operated during these two decades. We'll start by debunking the myth of the cowboy gunfighter, prevalent in countless western movies. Agnew writes in the Old West fact and film that quote, cowboys were not professional gunmen, but were common laborers who tended and herded cattle for a living. Put another way, the gunfighter was a killer of men and the cowboy was not. To start, the dismally low pay of cowboys made it difficult for them to purchase the quantity of ammunition necessary to develop the skills of a gunfighter. Even if they had developed those skills, the demands of their profession gave them little time to maintain them. While there were many good reasons reasons for cowboys to be armed, protecting the cattle from predators, rustlers, and so on. After the Stockman's Convention of 1882, most ranches in Kansas, Texas, and Wyoming banned cowboys from even carrying guns, believing that it was better for cowboys to tend the cattle and lawmen to dispense justice. While some cowboys were armed on cattle drives, many trail bosses required them to stow their pistols in the chuck wagon. Part of this was to reduce quarrels from turning deadly. The famed cattle baron Charles Goodnight allowed his cowboys to carry while on the trail, but cautioned them that if any man were found guilty of shooting another, he'd be tried, and if found guilty, hang from the nearest tree. The effectiveness of Goodnight's rules evident in that not a single one of his cowboys ever shot another. Another reason for not wearing guns is due to friction, that is, chafing from the belt and holster upon the man's hips or from the rifle scabbard on the horse's side. Such irritation caused sores, and sores easily became infected. Even regular belts or suspenders could cause problems, which is why most cowboys simply wore tight-waisted pants. When cowboys arrived at the railheads upon the conclusion of their cattle drives, they were paid several months' wages in one lump sum, handed back their pistols, and given permission to head into town to blow off some steam. A recipe for trouble if there ever was one. While they didn't need guns in town, cowboys still wore them as accessories, playing into the public image of themselves. Jack Weston, author of The Real American Cowboy, writes that, quote, the cowboy's style was partly a deliberate imitation of how the public saw them, and cowboys would defiantly and defensively justify that image by exaggeration, live up to the reputation, and even go beyond what the public expected. It would take advantage of their wild public image to scare the hell out of people. This is reflected in an article in the Dodge City Times which states that, quote, a gay and festive Texas boy, like all true sons of the Lone Star State, loves to fondle and practice with his revolver in the open air. It pleases his ear to hear the sound of his deadly weapon. Cowboys also carried guns because they signaled that a man had weight and couldn't be pushed around, which was particularly useful in the town teeming with rowdy young bucks. Of course, these guns were usually just dangerous props worn to support the posturing and bravado of the wearer. Most cowboys had no intention of actually resorting to gunplay, and even fewer had the nerve or skill, preferring instead to wave their gun around while making threatening remarks. And when cowboys did shoot, Agnew writes that they, quote, did not always immediately shoot to kill. While some might argue that this is due to moral reasons, it's more likely that cowboys simply lack proficiency. The sheer abundance of newspaper articles from the period relating to cowboys accidentally shooting themselves or even accidentally shooting others is a pretty good indication of the level of fire arm and neptitude amongst western cowboys. As evidence, consider the 1888 gunfight that occurred in New Mexico between a rancher named John Good and his five cowboy companions, against five other cowboys suspected of murdering his son. Despite over a hundred rounds being fired, the only casualties were two horses. Spice to say, cowboys weren't gunfighters. Gunfighters were a different breed. They made their living with guns. These weren't accessories, but rather tools of their trade, and they knew how to use them. Gunfighters like Wild Bill Hickok, Bat Masterson, and others practiced target shooting on a regular 
basis. John Wesley Hardin, who killed over 20 men, would shoot playing cards at distance, then sell them to onlookers as souvenirs. When it came to gunplay, these men were professionals, the cowboys were just amateurs. While a cowboy might unholster his weapon and wave it around, a gunfighter never reached for his gun unless he was serious about using it. A story from the Yorkville Inquirer illustrates this well. The gunfighter Clay Allison was having dinner with a man named Chunk Colbert at the Clifton House in northern New Mexico in January of 1874. The two men had a disagreement earlier in the day over a horse race, so to smooth things over, they decided to share a conciliatory dinner. At some point during the meal, Colbert decided to kill Allison and made his move. According to the article, Chunk, quote, dropped his knife on the floor and reached his hand below the table as if to pick it up, but instead went for his gun. Instantly, Allison pulled his pistol and shot him between the eyes. Chunk fell forward, dead, against the table, and Allison went on with his dinner as if nothing had happened. When asked later why he agreed to have dinner with a man who sought to kill him, Allison replied, quote, because I didn't want to send a man to hell on an empty stump. Another example took place in Bluff City, Kansas on July 7, 1781. On that day, a man named Juan Vidano killed a cowboy named William Coron. In response, several of Coron's friends, including the notorious gunfighter John Wesley Hardin, obtained a warrant for Bedeño's arrest. When the posse tracked him down, Hardin ordered Bedeño to surrender. When the man hesitated, Hardin simply pulled out his gun and shot him in the head. In 1910, the infamous lawman and gunfighter Wyatt Earp gave an interview over the intricacies of gunfighting. In it, he stated that, quote, when a man went after his guns, he did so with a single serious purpose. There was no such thing as a bluff. When a cowboy reached for his 45, every faculty he owned was keyed to shooting as speedily and as accurately as possible, to making his first shot the last of the fight. Wyatt Earp famously claimed that, quote, fast is fine, but accuracy is final. You must learn to be slow in a hurry. In his 1910 interview, Earp elaborated by saying, quote, the winner of a gunplay usually was the man who took his time. The second was that, if I hoped to live long on the frontier, I would shun flashy trick shooting, grandstand play, as I would poison. The flashy trick shooting that Earp was referring to involves shooting from the hip and fanning one's pistol. Shooting from the hip is exactly as it sounds. The gun is drawn and fired low from the hip rather than being fully extended and aimed down the barrel. If you're a gamer, you'd recognize this as no scoping. Fanning a gun refers to holding down the trick Trigger and repeatedly slapping back the hammer to fire bullets in rapid succession. Both are fast, but highly inaccurate. On fanning, Jeremy Agnew writes that, quote, though flashy, this technique was not used in serious gunfights because of the potential inaccuracy that occurred when repeatedly hitting the gun with the hand. Wyatt Earp concurred, saying that, quote, in all my life as a frontier police officer, I did not know a really proficient gunfighter who had anything but contempt for the gun fanner, or the man who literally shot from the hip. A historical example confirming why gun fanning was a terrible idea took place in a Dodge City saloon in April of 1879. Two men, cockeyed Frank Loving and Levi Richardson, pulled their guns simultaneously. Richardson fanned his revolver at close range, getting off five shots before Loving had fired a single bullet. All five missed. Loving drew slowly, coolly extended his arm, took careful aim, and killed Richardson with a single shot. Another instance took place in El Paso in April of 1894, when an intoxicated deputy U.S. Marshal named Bass Outlaw, yes, that's actually his name, got into a gunfight with the town constable, John Selman. Outlaw drew his revolver and fanned the hammer, sending several shots in rapid succession, but only succeeding in wounding Selman in the leg. Selman fired one shot, killing Outlaw. Suffice it to say, there's little point taking the spray and pray approach, as you could never miss fast enough to win a gunfight. Even holsters from the period reflected this. In the Old West, in fact, in film, the author writes that, quote, holsters were deep by design. Rather than designed for fast action, were intended to protect the hammer and trigger of a revolver to prevent accidental discharge of the gun into the wearer's leg. Instead of these holsters facilitating lightning fast draws, guns were more likely to become stuck in these cumbersome devices. An example of this occurred in New Mexico in 1877 when a man named Bill McCoy got into an argument with the deputy sheriff named Charles Gunn. According to the Albuquerque Daily Citizen, quote, McCoy was in Jim Walker's saloon when Gunn came in. A few angry words followed and Gunn attempted to draw his gun, but it caught in his holster and he was shot down by McCoy. Gun belts were also worn high on the hips, not slung in a low angle towards a dominant hand like we see in films. Those were called buscadero rigs, and they weren't invented until the 1920s. Some gunmen didn't even wear gun belts, preferring instead to keep their guns tucked into their pants waistline, sash, or in a leather-lined pocket holster. 
accuracy was important, but that's easier said than done during a gunfight. Gunfighters also needed another attribute. Call it nerve, courage, or bravery to keep a cool head when the lead flew. This is well illustrated in a verbal exchange between Wild Bill Hickok and a saloon owner named Phil Coe. Coe was bragging about his marksmanship to Wild Bill, claiming that he could, quote, shoot a crow on the wing, that is, in flight. To this, Hickok remarked, quote, did the crow have a pistol? Was he shooting back? I will be. In October of 1871, a gunfight ensued between the two. Coe fired first, but missed. Hickok fired twice, with both slugs tearing into Coe's abdomen. After suffering an agony, Coe died four days later. Wyatt Earp was famous for his calm, steady coolness in the midst of gunfights. In an interview with a reporter, Bat Masterson himself, a well-respected gunfighter, said of his close friend Wyatt Earp that he is, quote, one of the few men I personally knew in the West in the early days whom I regarded as absolutely destitute of physical fear. While we often think of the shootout at the OK Corral as his finest moment, an even more remarkable story illustrating his nerve took place during the Earp Vendetta ride, following the assassination of his brother Morgan. In March of 1882, Earp and five others stumbled upon nine members of the Cochise Cowboys gang at Iron Springs, Arizona. While Earp's men took cover, Wyatt stood his ground as all nine members of the enemy gang directed their fire at him. With steady nerves, Earp quickly scanned the gang, identified its leader, Curly Bill Brocious, leveled his shotgun, and nearly cut him in half. He then switched to his revolver and shot two others, prompting the gang's retreat. Stuart Lake, one of Earp's later biographers who personally interviewed Wyatt on several occasions, wrote that following the shootout, Wyatt inspected himself for damages. Quote, his coat hung in shreds, there were three holes through the legs of his trousers, five holes through the crown of his sombrero, and three through the brim. Despite the numbness in his leg, he could find no wound. He lifted his boot for closer inspection and found a bullet embedded in the high heel. As far as his body was concerned, he had come out of a hail of lead unscratched. When several members of the James Younger gang were cornered and outnumbered by a posse on the outskirts of Mendelia, Minnesota, and it became evident that they wouldn't escape, all kept their nerve. Cole Younger told his fellow gang members who were all hunkered down in the bushes that if anyone wanted to surrender, they were welcome to do so, but that, quote, this is where Cole Younger dies. At that, another man in the gang, named Charlie Pitts, responded, quote, all right, Captain, I can die just as game as you can. Let's get it done. At that, Pitts stood up, aimed his pistol at the closest posse man, and was shot through the heart dead. Despite his intention to die in the shootout, Cole Younger was captured, owing to being knocked unconscious after a bullet went through his eyeball and lodged in his jaw. In relation to the gunfight, a newspaper man named Robertus Love wrote that Cole Younger, quote, fought like a Bengal tiger, and that was no exaggeration. At the time of his capture, he had been shot 11 times, yet was still very much alive. Cole recovered and lived to be 72 years old, dying in 1916 with 14 bullets still left in his body from both the Civil War and outlaw days. Another instance occurred in December of 18 90 when the famed gunfighter, Luke Short, was ambushed in a Fort Worth saloon by a gambler named Charles Wright, who shot Luke Short at close range with a double barrel shotgun. To finish off Short, Wright dropped the empty shotgun and pulled his revolver, at which point a severely wounded Short managed to pull his own revolver and shoot Charles Wright through the right wrist, causing Wright to drop his gun and flee. Despite his injuries, Short managed to walk to a doctor's office on his own power, where the damage from the shotgun was assessed. According to the Fort Worth Daily Gazette, quote, the full charge of buckshot passed through the flesh, making a tunnel. The muscles on the outside were torn out. It continues by stating that, quote, the thumb and third and fourth fingers were torn badly. The thumb was taken off of the joint. Of course, like Cole Younger, Luke Short managed a full recovery, albeit with a few less fingers. Perhaps the most interesting example comes from Jim Miller, better known as Killer Miller or Deacon Jim, who may have been the hardest gunfighter to kill in the entire Old West. Much of this had to do with his habit of wearing an iron breastplate under his clothing, an early bulletproof vest, if you will, which saved his life on several occasions. Taking these stories into account, it's a little wonder why most gunfighters were simply assassinated. Some were shot in the back of the head, like Wild Bill Hickok while he was playing poker in Deadwood, South Dakota in 1876, or John Wesley Harden while playing dice in an El Paso saloon in 1895, or even Jesse James while straightening a picture in his living room in 1882. Others were ambushed, such as Billy the Kid, shot in a bedroom in the middle of the night in 1881, or Morgan Earp, shot in the back while playing pool in Tombstone, Arizona in 1882, or Ben Thompson, who was ambushed at a theater in San Antonio. Antonio in 1884. The list goes on and on. It makes it clear that it was easier to assassinate a dangerous man than roll the dice by slapping leather, especially with gunfire. 
Some gunfighters wore two guns, but they were rarely, if ever, used simultaneously. Wyatt Earp discussed this in his 1910 interview, saying that, quote, two-gun business is another matter that could stand some truth before the last of the old-time gunfighters is gone. They wore two guns, most of six gun toters did, and when the time came for action, went after them with both hands, but they didn't shoot them that way. Earp continues, quote, primarily two guns made the threat of something in reserve. They were useful as a display of force when a lone man stacked up against a crowd. Some men could shoot equally well with either hand, and in a gunplay, might alternate their fire. Others exhausted the loads from their gun on the right or the left, as the case may be, then shifted the reserve weapon to the natural shooting hand if that was necessary and possible. Such a move, the border shift, could be made faster than the eye could follow a top-notch gun thrower. But if a man was as good as that, the shift would seldom be required. Most legendary gunslingers prefer the Colt Single Action Army Model 1873. Among the list of those who carried it are Bass Reeves, Clay Allison, Luke Short, who preferred a snub-nosed version, Kid Curry, who preferred black grips, Billy the Kid, walnut grips, Killer Miller, pearl grips, and Bat Masterson, black grips, nickel-plated, and highly engraved. In Red Dead Online, this gun is the Cattleman's Revolver. Others chose the Smith & Wesson Model 3 Russian, including John Wesley Harden, who preferred ivory grips. White Earp, Jesse James, Frank James, and Cole Younger were all purported to use both Colt Model 1873s and Smith & Wesson Model 3s. While we don't know Earp's preference, the James and Youngers preferred theirs nickel-plated with ivory grips. In Red Dead Online, the Smith & Wesson Model 3 is a Schofield revolver. Doc Holliday preferred the Colt Model 1877 Lightning, nickel-plated with pearl handles. While this gun is not yet in the game, the double-action revolver has some similarities so it can work with a little imagination. While Bill Hickok preferred a Colt Navy Revolver Model 1851 with ivory grips. In Red Dead Online, this is the Navy revolver. Both Hickok and Holiday also use sawed-off shotguns as well. Gunfighters dressed in their own unique way, so there is no single gunfighter outfit. Some of these men were outlaws, some were lawmen, some were gamblers, and some were range detectives. As such, we're going to look at these men individually, then recreate their historical looks. Additionally, I just wanted to note that many of the most famous gunfighters of the Old West have been covered in my other clothing videos. So if you're looking to recreate Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, Wild Bill Hickok, or Bass Reeves, be sure to check out my How to Create a Historically Accurate Lawman video. If you're looking to recreate Billy the Kid or Jesse James, watch How to Create a Historically Accurate Outlaw. We'll start with the popular John Henry Holiday, better known as Doc Holiday, a dentist, gambler, and gunfighter who took part in the famed gunfight, the OK Corral. Most videos I've seen of folks creating Doc Holiday characters in Red Dead Online are modeled after fanciful costumes worn by actors playing him in major Hollywood films like Tombstone or Wide Earth. As much as I personally enjoy these movies, Doc Holiday's attire in them is completely made up. To determine what the real Doc Holiday wore, we must consult historical photos and sources. But in Doc's case, few photos allegedly depict depicting him can actually be verified. Nonetheless, one of these alleged photos, if it is indeed Doc Holliday, does give us a great glimpse of his attire, including his hat. But even if the photo isn't of him, we still have eyewitness reports describing Doc's clothing following the shootout at the OP Corral, and expert analysis by authors such as Professor Paula Mitchell Marks providing detailed descriptions of the attire worn that day by Holliday and the Herbs in her book and Die in the West, The Story of the OK Corral Gunfight. Using these resources, we can finally create a historically accurate Doc Holliday outfit in Red Dead Online. To start, you'll want the stovepipe square toe boots in solid black and black clerk pants. Up top, you'll want the white frumpy shirt, black paisley vest, and the black folded string tie. For a jacket, go with the black Antoine or roller jacket or the black worsted coat. If you're looking to recreate Holiday at the OK Corral, you'll want the gray shotgun coat, which several sources confirm he was wearing a concealed assault off shotgun he used to cut down Tom McLaurie. As for a hat, despite what you've seen in movies, all sources agree that Holiday wore a black bowler hat, even at the the OK Corral. For facial hair, Holiday sported what was called an aristocratic goatee accompanied by a mustache, which the barber in Red Dead Online calls the Nightly. We'll transition next to Luke Short, who, like Holiday, was a gambler, slight build, and small stature with a terrific capacity for gameness and gunplay. Short had worked as a cowboy and military scout before becoming a gambler and was friends with both Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. Over the course of his career, he killed several men, having a penchant for getting in so close to his opponent during gunfights that the blast from his revolver set their clothes on fire. To create Luke Short and Red Dead Online, you want the black stovepipe square toe boots and black clerk pants. Up top, you want the white frumpy shirt, black Richfield vest, 
vest, black puff tie, and black range gloves. For a jacket, go with the black classic frock coat. For a hat, the short stovepipe top hat is a perfect match. Before moving on from short, there's another famous photo of him posing as part of the Dodge City Peace Commission with Wyatt Earp, Bat Masterson, and others. As his attire in the photo is likely a better depiction of his everyday dress, we'll recreate this one as well. To do so, keep everything the same below the waist, but remove the gloves and swap out the Richfield vest for the tan traditional vest and replace the puff tie with the tan folded string tie. For a jacket, go with the black worsted coat, top it all off with a tan stride hat. Next, we'll look at John Wesley Harden, the greatest man killer of the Wild West, or the worst, depending on how you want to look at it. Historians conservatively place his body count around 20, but it's possibly as high as 44. Like yours truly, John Wesley Harden was the son of a Methodist minister, named after the founder of the Methodist Church, old John Wesley. His father had hoped he'd become a pastor, but that wasn't the way it turned out. Harden killed his first man at 15 and continued at a rapid pace thereafter. According to the book Draw, The Greatest Gunfights of the American West, author James Reasoner claims that by the time Harden was 18, he had killed at least 27 men. This would place him far beyond Billy the Kid's famous boast of killing 21 men by the time he turned 21 years old. To create the notorious man killer's look in Red Dead Online, you'll want the worn brown stovepipe square toe boots and the black clerk pants. Up top, you'll want the everyday overshirt in white, black paisley vest, and the black Antoine jacket. While there's no perfect option for his hat, I recommend the tan military scout hat or the tan Cayuga. Moving on to Clay Allison, a man so mentally unstable, supposedly from a childhood head injury, that he was dismissed from the Confederate Army during the Civil War after just three months of service, with the doctor stipulating that he was maniacal. Allison later killed his neighbor in a knife fight over water usage rights, severed the head of a local serial killer, blew up a newspaper office with a keg of gunpowder, and allegedly killed over 20 men. To get Allison's look and read that online, you'll want the worn brown stovepipe square toe boots and the green striped depot pants. Up top, you want the everyday overshirt and white, tan traditional vest, and the dark everyman's jacket. While there's no photo showing Allison wearing a hat, I still recommend the brown military scout hat. Next up is Jim Miller, aka Killer Miller, or Deacon Jim. Miller was a dark, troubled soul, who just at the age of eight was a leading suspect in the murder of his own grandparents, whom he was living with at the time. When older, Miller became a lawman, Texas Ranger, a gambler, and ultimately a professional assassin, killing over a dozen men. Before being hanged, Miller was asked to admit his crimes. He responded, quote, let the record show I've killed 51 men. After his death, one respected citizen said of Miller, quote, he was just a killer, the worst man I ever knew. To get Killer Miller's look and read that online, you want the black stovepipe square toe boots and the black clerk pants. Up top, you want the everyday overshirt in white, the black paisley vest, and black folded string tie. Miller was famous for his long black frock coat, which he buttoned all the way up in order to obscure the iron plate he wore under his clothing. While we can't fully button our coats and read that online, we still have access to the appropriate coat, so pick up the frock coat in black. As for a hat, Miller was photographed wearing both tan and black hats. I recommend the tan military scout hat or the stride hat in either tan or black. From here, you can design your own gunfighter by mixing and matching different historically accurate components from this video and from my others. Have fun, keep looking historically accurate, and I'll see you out on the trail. Thank you folks for watching. If you guys enjoyed the video, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. If you want to further support my efforts, you can do so on Patreon, or you can buy some gear for the... Try that again. Or you can buy some gear for the Modern Frontier at the Man vs. History Outfitter shop. Thank you folks for watching. Please stop by again. We'll see you next time. Before I go, I just want to make sure that I thank my Patreon patrons. So special thanks to my gold tier patrons, Tyler Bauschock Rodriguez, Ashley Gertensen, The Innocents, Hurt and Wade, Man vs. Moose, Bryce V, Cyber, Chasing Victory, Combo Raven, Rich Christensen, Comrade Krieger, Dawson E, Song the Breezes, Noah Ovens, Sneaky Ninja, Noah5943, John Goley, Jigsaw, David Perkins, Yinzian, and Arjun Bakker. Also gotta make sure that I thank my silver and bronze tier Patreon patrons as well. Thank you all for all of your support. Let's keep growing. Let's keep doing what we're doing. Have a good night, folks.